Today on Earth Focus, pioneering renewable energy in Southern Africa, the people and technologies that are reshaping Africa's energy future. Coming up on Earth Focus. Africa is a continent in transition. While some African countries are experiencing an oil and gas boom, half of Africa's population continues to live on less than $1.25 a day. And most of the poor lack not only income, but also access to affordable and reliable sources of energy. Without electricity, students can't study when the sun goes down, clinics can't refrigerate vaccine, and businesses shut their doors. The cycle of poverty continues. But Africa's sun, wind, and water resources make it ideal for renewable energy development, and entrepreneurs and businesses are quickly catching on. Correspondent Jeff Barbie travels through four countries in Southern Africa to explore emerging renewable technologies that may be more sustainable than fossil fuels and that are already helping to alleviate poverty while protecting the environment. Botswana is best known for diamonds, big game, sunshine, and desert. Trees are few and far between in many places, yet 80% of the people here use scarce firewood for their energy needs, depleting the country further of its natural resources. Crosby Menzies from Solar Cookers for Africa is on a mission to change all of that. I got into solar cooking when visiting schools around the country and watching the way that they prepared the food using firewood. I'd seen the technology in Zambia and I just thought this is an absolute no-brainer. Here is a way for people in Africa to cook at no cost, making no emissions and it's completely clean and sustainable. Menzies is thinking big and has embarked on an ambitious journey through Africa already visiting Zambia, South Africa, and now Botswana, spreading the gospel of solar energy one community at a time. I like the idea of a continent where the sun comes up and millions of dishes are faced towards the sun to do the daily cooking. The United Nations Environmental Program reports that Africa is losing nearly 10 million acres of forest every year, twice the world's average deforestation rate. This is not from clear cutting by timber companies. It is due to the overuse of wood for home cooking fires like this one. People that are collecting firewood are the same people who really are not on a financial system. So they do not have a lot of money and resources available to them. No matter how cheap we make the cookers, we still can't reach the people that we really need to reach. And therefore we need funding in order to be able to do that. Solar cookers reduce emissions by the simple fact that food cooked on a solar cooker doesn't require firewood which releases emissions which then makes the solar cookers eligible for carbon financing. Aside from government and private support, a recent international agreement called the RED system has made it easier for projects like Menzies to tap into the carbon markets for funding. We've been working in carbon trading mechanisms whereby we're able to put out solar cookers into communities that's financed through the carbon markets. The solar dishes focus light from the sun onto a pot, and Menzies believes the systems are easy enough for anyone to use. There's our power. Solar cookers come in a box that you can carry on the back of a bicycle. They take about 20 minutes to put up, put together. They're extremely easy to use. You need no specialized skills or knowledge or tools to assemble and use a solar cooker. It's very, very easy to just point at the sun and learn how to use. Menzies has put together a solar caravan traveling throughout Southern Africa. The crew is distributing solar technology and trying to reach people in some of the most remote places on the continent. The caravan is in the sense of the old silk caravans, as in people taking spices from India all the way to Europe. They weren't just taking spices, they were taking information, they were swapping stories, and it was bringing a cultural togetherness. So we want to do the same thing with solar technology in Southern Africa. In 2009, the government of Botswana put out an urgent call for solar energy projects that tap into the 315 cloudless days per year. 
if this stable democracy of two million people manages to capture only a small part of that energy, the future of the environment and the people will be very bright indeed. You don't have people without the environment. You don't have an environment without people. To be promoting technologies that can actually assist people while helping the environment, I couldn't imagine doing a better thing. I couldn't imagine it. There's simply nothing I would want to do more than what I'm doing right now. In the vastness of Botswana's Kalahari Desert, the sun is powering a communications revolution. Huge distances separate electrical utilities in this desert country of two million people, and there are very few fixed phone lines. In the past, Botswana relied on expensive diesel generators to run hundreds of remote cell phone towers. The system works very well, and it's better than the diesel systems, because diesel is expensive to run. But with distance, we just use the energy from the sun and it has more or less maintenance free. According to the World Bank, Botswana has 143 cell phone subscriptions per 100 people. That's more than the UK, Germany, the United States and Japan. Cell phones here are as ubiquitous as donkey carts, wild animals and gorgeous sunsets. Now these affordable solar cell phone towers offer a better, cleaner way to connect. The old diesel systems each consumed 3,200 gallons of fuel every year. And that didn't include the fuel used to drive trucks across the country to maintain and refuel the generators. And in a country chronically short on power, users say solar towers have been remarkably dependable. Even the national grid is not that reliable. We have a lot of power outages and all that while we have enough energy from the sun. Botswana has one of the highest solar energy indices in the world, according to the UN. To take advantage of it, the system uses solar photovoltaic panels to run the cell phone microwave equipment and charge a bank of deep cycle batteries. At night, batteries like these in the remote town of Leshebitse power the system until morning. It has changed lives for people like 19-year-old Oteng Muketsi, who uses his cell phone to keep in touch with his far-flung family, organize schoolwork, and speak to his girlfriend two towns away. Yes, we can make calls easily, because the Mascom Tower is always, is always working. At Mascom's headquarters in Gaborone, the country's capital, there is more to come. Soon they plan to roll out a fourth generation data system to deliver broadband internet to most cell phone subscribers. Data utilization is the main core for everybody to access internet, downloads, and we're making that possible, of course. And that too will be largely powered by the sun. first time I opened my eyes, I saw hydropower. I was born into the hydroelectric business. Our family's been hydropowered 60 years. My uncle and my father did the development on the first plant. We lived on a little farm down in the Eastern Cape. And uh, there was, electricity was an unknown thing in that part of the world at that time. Since 1978, Pat Downey has been an alternative energy pioneer. He designs micro hydroelectric power stations known more simply as micro hydros. Like their much larger cousins, these small plants generate electricity from kinetic energy released from falling water. But the similarity ends there. Until recently, Downey's small systems were too expensive to compete with grid electricity prices. But the increase in power costs and new technological breakthroughs have now driven consumers to his workshop in the small town of Hofmeyer, South Africa, about nine hours drive from Cape Town. Yeah, hydropower was not economically viable because the, the government actually subsidized the production of electricity. So South Africa had one of the cheapest electricity rates in the world. That has now changed dramatically. Now subsidies are being reduced and, and national utility have now got to show a profit. They're not getting a handout from the government. 
South Africa's state-run energy company called ESCOM has raised electricity tariffs by 40% per year for the last few years and vows to continue. So Downey sprung into action and partnered with local engineer Dennis Clark to create Vortex Hydro Systems. The company helps farmers and rural communities develop small-scale hydroelectric power systems that reduce their power costs. But he doesn't just want to cut costs, he wants to clear the skies. Coal-fired nuclear power stations, I don't like those things. And I mean, what does a coal-fired power station do? Up you, when you get up in the Johannesburg area, you look at all the smog there, where's it come from? It comes from a coal-fired power station. People want the systems and they realize not only the advantages of, of generating their own power from a cost point of view, but also the, the effect it has on the environment. Microhydro is roughly classified as any plant that produces less than 300 kilowatts of electricity. Vortex Hydro markets cross-flow turbines like this one that produce about 56 kilowatts. This is enough power for roughly 20 homes. Each plant prevents about 16 tons of carbon and sulfur dioxides from being released by a coal-fired power station. But there is a stigma attached to microhydro power that has prevented it from being widely adopted. The biggest challenge is awareness of what it's really all about. Because the moment you mention hydropower, the thought comes up of massive dams, massive hydropower schemes. The advantage of, of microhydro is that you, you, you use a small portion of the river to generate the fall and without actually interfering with the flow. The environmental impact of a microhydro scheme on the ecology of a river is limited to the footprint of the turbine itself. Unlike large-scale dams like this one, the Harib Dam, which flood huge areas of land, cut off migrating species and cause habitat loss, Downey feels that the environmental benefits of microhydro systems far outweigh their small impact. It is ecologically sustainable because you, 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 you're not using a resource. I mean, in South Africa, water is a scarce resource, but you're only using the energy in the water. Downey has built more than 60 microhydro power stations across Africa. His turbines are generating power in Malawi, Lesotho, South Africa, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the government has commissioned two that he is currently working on. The energy in falling water has powered human systems like grain milling for thousands of years. And today, Downey believes, it is still one of the best hopes for removing our dependency on fossil fuels. If we could have thousands of microhydros feeding into the national grid and shutting down our coal-fired power stations, that's, that's a dream. When I first told my kids that I was joining Durban Solid Waste, they looked at me and said, I'm going to be a dustbin man. Today, when they look at me and what I'm doing and how much they're learning about what their father is heading up, they only come with pride and passion and they often come to my project. Mark Wright is working on the frontier of green technology, creating electricity from trash at dumps around the South African city of Durban. And now this city of three and a half million people is drawing power from this surprising source. Basasa Road landfill is probably one of the largest landfills in southern Africa. We take approximately 4,000 tonnes of waste per day and a high portion of that is biodegradable waste. On that basis, the landfill gas extraction system was implemented. For most people, dumps are a smelly necessity to modern living. But it's this gas, this smell, that contains methane. In our case, we actively extract the landfill gas through an extraction system in the landfill and take it down to the gas compound where we then use it as a fuel through the engines which generate the electricity and put back into the electricity grid. Long perforated pipes are laid in vast trenches and then covered. These hoses siphon the methane that comes off of the decomposing layers of garbage. 
This gas is channeled to the power generation compound. 108 cubic meters of gas an hour comes from each well, and foreign experts who visit the project are amazed at what this third world city has accomplished. Here we are in the brain center of the whole project, and here we have the computer which shows a very simple process that takes place, the extraction of the landfill gas diverted to the gas engines as the methane is used as the fuel to turn the engine uh, which generates the electricity and put back into the electricity grid. With the system that we've got here now and the current rate of uh, gas extraction, we are currently generating, generating enough power to supply about five to six thousand low-cost houses. Methane is 21 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. That means that saving or burning one ton of methane is equal to preventing 21 tons of CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. So by preventing this gas from escaping and using it to replace dirty coal power, the project is offering a major emissions reduction that if used widely has the power to slow climate change. These emissions reductions are called carbon credits and the city of Durban is trying to sell these credits to help fund the project. A developing country like South Africa is reliant on carbon trading to fund a project of this nature. A project of this nature, just on electricity sales, due to the low cost of electricity, would not be financially feasible. With World Bank and other funding, the project is secure for now, but by getting their carbon credits approved, the project will be successful far into the future creating green landfill sites that improve the quality of life in this coastal city. Forest destruction is a problem throughout the region. But in a small developing country like Malawi, it is an environmental catastrophe. Malawi is one of the most deforested countries in the world, and the remaining forests and woodlands are being cut down at an alarming rate. Throughout the country, timber cutting by local communities has been reducing former forests to marginal farmland. A year ago, thick Miombo woodland covered this area near Mangochi but the relentless need for energy from communities and a lack of other viable fuel options has seen it disappear. But there may be some hope. Technology is coming to the Malawian countryside and it's something to sing about. On a recent Sunday in Manjanja village, a group has gotten together to sing, to gossip, and to make Mbaula Chiteteza stoves. This is the Imbaula Chitetezo stove. Its name means environmental protection. Though simple, the stove has radically reduced the amount of wood Malawian households need for their energy. In the past, the three stone fire, like this one, was the best technology available. The stove burns cleaner for much longer on less than half the wood, and it's made from locally sourced materials. Linda Chiwaya explains how using this technology has changed life in her village. Yeah. The technology is in the design. The materials and building techniques are local and affordable. Hestian Innovations, a plucky Irish company concerned about deforestation and looking for ways to get Africa involved in the carbon economy, appreciated the difficulty of carbon trading through forestry. If we could get carbon credits here in Malawi for reforesting with smallholder farmers, we would love to do it. But we know that it's just too difficult. It's too complicated, so we're better off focusing in on energy efficiency. They looked at the problem in a different way, 
What if they could reduce forest destruction by using technology to reduce wood consumption and in turn reduce CO2 emissions? The technology we're promoting reduces the need for wood. So instead of using 10 pieces of wood, they can now use four pieces of wood. This is a big cost saving for them, but it also reduces pressure on the forest, so there's less trees being cut down. Tobacco is one of the main cash crops throughout Malawi. The most lucrative tobacco is cured in wood-fired kilns. The technology that Hestian Innovations is promoting reduces wood consumption in these kilns by about 50%. These are called rocket barns, and in two years, they have sold almost a thousand of them. We're at the stage now where we've got about 800, 900 of these barns out there. The farmers are talking about them, they're loving the idea, they want more barns. Demand is very high. We can bring them this cleaner technology that can benefit their lives. By selling stoves and barns through microloans on a massive scale and using carbon financing to help fund part of the costs, Hestian Innovations reduces carbon emissions and makes their money through a long-term monitoring system, which measures how much CO2 is not going into the atmosphere. We don't get a carbon credit for building a barn or for building a stove. We get carbon credits when we can verifiably demonstrate that these technologies are working. So we're not going to build the barn for this farmer and walk away. We have to come back here every year for the next six years, possibly for the next 20 years. And that's something very good. That's after sales service that just doesn't exist. It is a long-term commitment that is rare in Africa, even among aid agencies. And right now, that commitment is coming from carbon trading. Our project would never have got to where it is today without carbon trading and carbon trading gives us very ambitious targets to reach and we can reach them. African forests can be a part of the solution to global warming. Africans and project developers in Africa are eager and prepared to enter the carbon trade and use it to create sustainable forestry projects. Old electrical technology has hampered the development of renewable energy in many African countries. But Namibia has a plan to wean itself off of expensive electricity imports from nearby South Africa. It has renovated the national grid to help make people's homes into power production systems. If we are now talking of the smart grid uh, technologies, the potentials mostly in Namibia is solar, solar energy, wind energy, and biomass energy. The government wants to have a significant amount of the country's energy coming from renewables by 2020. Our target for renewable energy capacity is 10 percent. Yeah. But getting small producers into production has only recently become possible. It's the first country in Africa to create both new laws and an electrical grid like this one in the capital Windhoek. It can take power from many different sources anywhere in the system. Architect Wim de Wolf installed a solar array to reduce his own electricity costs and also to show his clients what is possible with the new technology. It is a very smart investment because the, the payback of this investment would be between six and eight years. But also if um, smaller consumers could be helping out the, the system by putting that in the grid, we would not have to import that much energy from South Africa because we could be a lot more self-sufficient. De Wolf hooks his solar array directly into Windhoek's smart grid, allowing him to feed it when his home produces excess energy and to draw from it when solar power runs short. This reduces the cost of the system because he doesn't need expensive batteries. 
if we would not be able to use a grid as it is now, then we would have to have a total separate uh, battery system. Now everything that you produce too much goes into the grid. Namibia's state-controlled power company, Nampower, has also installed a solar array to run their headquarters in downtown Windhoek. And other large projects are already powering remote desert communities in the Namib Desert. The government has a 20-year, three-part plan to expand this technology. Number one is uh, individuals to take up loans, because you know that these products are very expensive. It's a five-year program and then you have to deposit 5%. The interest rate is also 5%. Component two, there's the government responsibility of uh, connecting all the far remote schools, uh, clinics, to renewable energy technologies. And then the last one is to establish what we call uh, energy shops. The shops will sell renewable energy systems and sign up customers to the government loan program. It will take years to reach their goals, but officials believe the system should already be a model for other countries in Africa. On a continent beset by chronic energy shortages, this kind of green solution could change the lives of millions. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.